And if you're a boss, this is what you need to tell your people. And if you're a subordinate, this is what you have to tell your boss and say, um, I just heard on this great podcast the way to manage up to you, my boss. Or if you're the boss, you could say, I heard this podcast. And if you want to manage up to me, here's the best way to do it. Whenever you come to me, if you're my subordinate, I want you to be four things. Relevant, meaning whatever you're going to talk to me is relevant to what we're trying to accomplish and relevant to what the heck I can do for you. Be relevant, be clear, be concise, be gone. Okay, <laughs> sounds good. Sounds so, good. So make yeah, the introduction. Well, make the introduction. We'll have fun. We'll get in and out of trouble. And cool, cool. Yeah. Well, I was gonna ask a couple questions beforehand. Um, first off, I wanted to ask. So it's funny that you emailed me about your um, your TEDx. your latest TEDx. Yeah, because I I was going back doing some last second stuff this morning, and I been watching some of your YouTube stuff and I typed in and I saw this new video. I was like, wait, was this really just posted yesterday? So I actually watched it before you sent it. Um, and I loved it. So I want to ask you what's what's made you smile today? Well, what made me smile is, for one thing, meeting you. And we can we can talk about that. Uh, I mean, I have a story with everything I talk about. So what made me smile in meeting you is it's a chance for me to be relevant instead of an old fart. So I had a friend named, actually I had seven mentors, they've all died. And my last mentor, who you probably won't know the name of, which will explain the anecdote, his name was Warren Bennis. Warren Bennis was one of the top people in the field of leadership. If, I mean, some, he's in the top three people in leadership who ever lived. Mm -hmm. And before he died, he said to me, he said, you know, Mark, I'm trying to be a good sport, but they parade me around the, the MBA school at USC to the MBAs, and they point out all these leadership books that I've written. And you know, Mark, I'm irrelevant. And I'm trying to be a good sport because I got to be relevant into my 70s and even 80s. And a lot of people, you know, in this, in this age, you're not relevant after you're 70, 75, unless you can give funding and make contacts for younger people. That's what they want from you if you're older. And he said, I'm trying to be a good sport because I got to be relevant older than a lot of people. And that really stuck with me. And the way that I remain relevant is I mentor about 25 people at various frequencies from apparently once every six years, I had lunch with someone. This woman said, you know, you're my mentor. I said, wow, you're a cheap date. I just have to stop <laughs> once every six years. Right. And, some people, and some people will say, you know, you said something to me five years ago and it just stuck with me. So you're a mentor of mine. And then there's other people that I speak to every week. And, and the difference between coaching and mentoring, uh, a company will hire me to coach people to get better performance out of them, get their numbers up. But the company really doesn't care about my developing them as a person. The company really doesn't care about my finding out who that person is meant to be. See, when you mentor someone, you distill and you focus in on them into the future they're meant to live. And then I help people with that, and then I use everything in my power to help them land in their future. Mm. So there's like a mutual love, yeah. uh, and, so I, and I get to be relevant, you know, as long as I don't bore them with all these old war stories. And some of my war stories are interesting. I've trained hostage uh, negotiators. I was in the O.J. Simpson trial, and I was a suicide specialist for 25 years, and nobody killed themselves. So so some of that's sort of interesting. <clears throat> Actually, when I speak to people your age, it's funny. Sometimes I'll say, it's all name drop. And I'll say, uh, you might think it's interesting. I'll, I'll say, you might think it's interesting or not that interesting that I was in the O.J. Simpson trial uh, with the prosecution, that I've trained hostage negotiators. 
that I was a suicide expert for 25 years, but none of that's going to impress you as much as the next slide I'm going to show you. And the slide is, and I say, they film super bad in my house. <laughs> and I, Do they actually? Oh, yeah. I have a picture of, of McLovin. I don't even know the guy's name. But next to yeah. Seth Rogen. They're sitting on my bed after McLovin had sex. And I said, that's my bedroom. Oh, oh my gosh. I, see, there you go. The other stuff was impressive, but it works every time. You go, oh, my God, Mark, you're right. That's what I'm going to remember. The hell with the other stuff. So it's kind of interesting. Yeah, no, that's hysterical. Oh my gosh, that's, that's so funny. <laughs> um, so, well, I'm, I'm curious now, you, you know, you said um, you want to, this is an opportunity for you to stay relevant. What do you, when you say relevant, what does that exactly mean to you? Like, what do you have to, what does it, what, if, if for you to be relevant, like say you're not relevant now and you want to be relevant, what do you have to be able to get to be able to say you you are relevant currently? Well, it's not me who defines my being relevant. It's you. And, and here's a little tip if you're listening in. Um, and if you're a boss, this is what you need to tell your people. And if you're a subordinate, this is what you have to tell your boss and say, um, I just heard on this great podcast the way to – manage up to you, my boss. Or if you're the boss, you could say, I heard this podcast. And if you want to manage up to me, here's the best way to do it. Whenever you come to me, if you're my subordinate, I want you to be four things. Relevant, meaning whatever you're going to talk to me is relevant to what we're trying to accomplish and relevant to what the heck I can do for you. Be relevant, be clear, be concise, be gone. Mm. I like that. Because when you're not relevant, when you're not clear, when you're not concise, and you can't take a hint that I'm too busy, you're going to make me crazy. And I'm going to avoid you. And it's all done unconsciously. Yeah. Doesn't gotcha. that make sense? Yeah, yeah, no, it does. It does. I think um so it so it essentially your attempt to be relevant currently with the younger crowd is to be able to kind of know what is currently being talked about, currently important to people and that sort of thing, be able to kind of gain a knowledge of that and talk about those matters in a clear and concise way. Well, well, well here's a, here's a uh, you know uh, my book just listen i'm pretty humbled by it because it became the top book on listing in the world it's mm -hmm. in 25 languages and i spoke in moscow a few months ago along with a nobel prize winner again someone you will not, never maybe not know his name is daniel kahneman he wrote a book called thinking fast and slow and there were three of us speaking and i was excited and there's all kinds of videos of me on youtube you know the audience and uh, russian audience and what I introduced to the Russian audience, which I'm introducing to you and I'm introducing to your listeners, and it supports relevance, is if you can focus on what the other person is listening for, not what they're listening to, but what they're listening for. So, so I'll, I'll, do it, I'll do it right now with you. This is what yeah. you're listening for. Because I saw when I said it, you nodded, you took it in, you're thinking about it, and you're thinking, I hope he explains what the hell he means by it. Uh, but what you're listening for, I think, because I've checked out some of your great interviews, is you're, you're hoping that our interview gets more interest from your audience. You're hoping that whatever we cover uh, creates a must-see podcast. You know, because you get must-see podcasts, people want to advertise with you, you know, it, it's all good. Right. So you're hoping that'll happen, and you're hoping that I will give some information or something that is so irresistible to you and your audience that they say, oh, this is must-see, this is must-watch. 
I already gave you a tip with the relevant, clear, concise, be gone. People are listening. Write that down, put it in front of your boss, and you will make them smile. Um, and, then, and then the third thing is what you're listening for is you're listening for whatever we come up with to be immediately doable by your audience. Yeah. They don't have time to read a book. They don't have time to take a course. They don't have time for an upsell. So they're wanting to get quicker, better results uh, that, that they never would have gotten anywhere else that are immediately doable. Mm. Does that make sense? Is that what you're listening yeah, yeah. to? One hundred percent. That last that last part is something big that I'm very intentional about trying to get out of my guess for sure. Yeah. So uh, without further ado, I'm going to just spill some tips that you're going to write down because it seems everybody writes these down. And if you're yeah. listening, you might write these down. Uh, I've done a lot of things, uh, but a, a couple years ago, I toured as Steve Jobs coming back from the dead. I had the turtleneck wow. on, I had the glasses on, and I liked it because I got to be, you know, it freed my inner asshole. I mean, <laughs> I, I, I was just him. I was just him. And, uh, uh, of course, my wife will say, you know, you know, Mark, it's not so inner. I said, well, that's just at home. Uh, but, uh, but the whole idea of playing Steve Jobs was to reveal a secret four-step formula that he unconsciously followed, that Elon Musk follows, that Jeff Bezos follows, and they don't know they're following it. And here's the formula for causing fanatical customers. He's getting the pencil and paper up. What you want to trigger in the other person is woe, W-H-O-A, wow, W-O-W, Hmm, H M M M. Yes. Whoa, wow, hmm, yes. And what is whoa? Whoa means I can't believe what I just saw, heard, or read. So it's disruptive to people of ADD, and, and you know you've created whoa when a person says, Can you repeat that? Or if you're giving a presentation, someone who's texting says to the person next to them, What did he say? What did she say? What's a whoa? The wow is. That's amazing. That's astonishing. That's unbelievable. You do that? Yeah, that's, we do that every day. And what's the hmm? The hmm is, this is too good not to use. I don't know how I'm going to use it, but this is too good not to use. And then the yes is, ah, found out how I'm going to use it. So the centerpiece of my Steve Jobs thing is I show a video and you can find the video if you look up National Geographic Steve Jobs Xerox Park, and that's P-A-R-C. And there's a two-minute video of a dramatization of Steve Jobs going to Xerox Park and discovering the mouse and the icons. It's two minutes, and you watch the actor playing Steve Jobs, and as soon as he sees it, you know, it's, the anecdote starts out, his, his arms are crossed because, you know, he's Steve Jobs. He's cynical. He doesn't believe anything. And you see him lean in and you see his face and his face is like, wow. And then uh, he asks uh, the person from Xerox Park, can I try it? And then he gets there and he's holding the mouse and he's watching the screen and all these icons are popping up and you see the wow, he's sweating. And then in the anecdote, he looks back at Steve Wozniak with a hmm, like, what do you think about this? And in the anecdote, Wozniak, who's part of the real Wozniak, says, you know, when he did that, I told Steve, there's no going back. There's no going back to typing. Yeah. And then the end of the two minutes is uh, Walter Isaacson, who wrote the book uh, on Steve Jobs, says they didn't know what to do with it, Xerox Park. But Steve Jobs took it back to Apple and created the Macintosh. Mm. But it's a great dramatization of whoa, wow, hmm, yes. And so uh, when my team advises companies, 
we advise them on how do you create whoa, wow, hmm, yes, because if you're not, you're creating, nah, never mind, no thanks, bye. So everything that your market sees, hears, or reads needs to trigger whoa, wow, hmm, yes. So if that's the four-step process, what is the hardest step to get to like is the is the woe something that a lot of people are doing and they're not getting them to wow is are they people good at the woe and the wow but can't get them to hmm? it's like where's the gap between that a lot of people miss well the challenge is the whoa wow uh, and, and, and those are like siamese twins but you know steve jobs would say you have to see beyond what your customer can imagine so, so Steve Jobs was able to see, oh, here's something, here's another tidbit to write down. It's something uh, I was actually working on with my mentor, Warren Bennis, but then he got sick. And this is what I call the three Ds of visionary leadership. Steve Jobs had it, Elon Musk had it. Um, and the, the first D is you define reality. So what did Steve Jobs say? One day, everybody's going to have a personal computer. They don't know it yet, but one day, everybody's going to have a personal computer. Elon Musk said, one day, they're going to run on electricity. You know, this gas so, stuff, screwing. So you define reality that other people can't yet see. The second D is you declare your intention to make it happen. I don't know how we're going to make it happen. It's impossible, but we're going to make it happen. And then the third D is you decide strategy. This is how we're going to make it happen. So that's what a visionary leader can do. Wow. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, I think that's awesome. I think that I liked the, the first part of define reality as, as currently reality is not. You know what I mean? Like define reality down the road, define reality in the future. Mm-hmm. So, for instance, uh, here's, some, here's some unsolicited suggestions. Okay. Um, I don't know if you're already doing this, uh, but if you chopped up your podcasts into TikTokable 10, 15 second segments, uh, People think like that. People are becoming more impatient. You know, they, you know, even now I've given you some good information, but people say he's still too long winded. You know, you know, I'm going to have to listen to your podcast when he speaks at, you know, one and a half speed because he's still too slow. Right. Uh, but if you can do that for them, you know, whatever TikTok allows, except, you know, people at TikTok are too young. But if it's 15 seconds, well, well, yes. Or um, mm -hmm. the three D's of visionary, visionary leadership. And you just start, I don't know, floating those things out there. Uh, people are going to want to find out what's that about. Yeah. Make sense? You know, and and I, don't, I don't know how you organize it. That's, up, you know, that's above my pay grade. Um, uh, something else. Here's another tip. So do you like these tips? Yeah, for sure. 100%. You know, so uh, these are these are these are the best things because, like you said, it's kind of like that last aspect. Ever everybody's listening for uh, something they kind of hadn't hadn't heard before, but then they're looking for like the actionable things, and everybody loves these lists of give me these the three Ds, give me these four steps, that sort of thing. Because for whatever reason, people can take them and they can find a way for whatever reason they can find a way that it makes sense in their own life and take action on it i think that's why the like these tips and and lists like that are what everybody's drawn to yeah so i think if you cut them up so, so i'm going to do a little i don't know it probably won't be 15 seconds but there's a concept called uh uh Well, I'm flashing on it. It's um, mental real estate. Okay. You know, you have to edit that one out. I paused too long. You, 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 I saw you already checking your text messages. Uh, <laughs> but it's got mental real estate. Uh, a friend of mine named Tony Baxter designed Disney Tokyo and Disney Paris. 
and he shared the concept with me. And what, what mental real estate is, is you come up with something that's familiar, so you get into people's minds, and then you twist it. So he said, Pirates of the Caribbean owns the word pirates in the minds of kids. Mm. So Disney owns pirates. Because when kids think of pirates, they think of pirates of the Caribbean. You know, a friend of mine wrote a book, Never Eat Alone, Keith Ferrazzi. If you think of those three words, never eat alone, those are emotional words. My latest book, so here's an exercise in you know, titles and, um, and also marketing. So after just my most recent book is called Talking to Crazy, How to Deal with the People that Drive You Crazy. It's not about mental illness. And when I came up with the title, every time I said it to someone, I'm writing a book called Talking to Crazy, everybody smiled. I said, what are you smiling about? They said, I do that every day. So that's, <laughs> mental, that's mental real estate. And people would say, what if the crazy person is yourself? Oh, yeah, we got plenty of chapters on that. So that has a fair amount of mental real estate, talking to crazy. But here is where I would have loved it. So I, I went over to Russia and I spoke there. Um, and, uh, and, the, and, and I asked them, I said, why are you having me speak there? You know, you know the, the other speakers are academics, Nobel Prize winners. I mean, what the hell are you having me there? And they said, Dr. Goulston, yes, they are that. But they did not have a book that went viral. So my book, Talking to Crazy, I kid you not, the Russian edition is How to Talk to Assholes. Oh, my God. And it, and it went viral. <laughs> Just the power of the word change is crazy. How to, yeah, so that's a lot of mental real estate, how to talk with assholes. Jeez, this is like not at all how, this is awesome. Not at all how I expected it to go, but I'm loving where this is going. Um, there's a gap between, and, and almost because this is where we, we were stemming from the, the trust thing and, and, and promises and stuff like that. There is, you talk about in your book, Just Listen, how there's this gap between how we per perceive ourselves and how others perceive us. And I want to ask, how do we determine what that gap looks like, first off? And then once we've determined it, how do we work on closing that gap? So, I, you know, I like giving stories. So, uh, so I'm glad you teed up this story. So there's a friend of mine. I can't mention his name, but he's pretty well known. And I was one of his early mentors. And when he was in his 20s, he was a wonderkinder. Everybody thought he'd be whatever. But then when he reached his middle 30s, people say, said, how come you're not a billionaire yet? You know? And, uh, and he had a lot of money, but he wasn't a billionaire. And one of the things I told him is I said, you know, when you're a wonderkinder in your 20s, people are throwing money at you. But you've taken a few hits, and so people are going to be hesitant to throw their money at you. And this guy talked a mile a minute, and he was a very quick study, smart study. And, and I'm not mentioning the name because you'll say, he is. I mean, he's amazing. Uh, but what I told him is I said, when you talk fast and people see that, you know, it wasn't smooth sailing after your 20s, they're going to be hesitant to give you money. And when you talk fast, you're going to come off as anxious and nervous and, and pushy. And I said, I know you're a quick and deep study because you're so freaking smart. And I said, this is what I want you to do to discipline yourself. And you need to practice it. Every time someone says something to you, pause for at least a half a second and say, hmm, because that will communicate to them that you actually listened and considered what they said. Whereas what you're doing now is you go bump, 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 bump. And what happens is, yeah, what you're saying is really smart, but the other person who doesn't want to lose money is thinking, he didn't even take in what I said. He didn't consider it. And I told this guy, I say, you consider it. You're just that smart, but, you, but you're reminding people of and, and the word he liked using is I said, you need to be more deliberate, you, meaning you need to deliberate about what they say so they feel you considered it. 
and he just started disciplining himself. So if you're a fast talking person, which everybody is at these networking events, right. where everybody's talking fast, nobody's making eye contact, people are always looking over other people's shoulders for something better. You know, you've been to those. Um, and I think if you can just pause, make eye contact, and, and take that half or one second, look them in the eye and go, hmm, they feel like you considered what they said, and it will increase their trust. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, I love that. So, and he he essentially had this 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 gap in perception. Um, yeah, he thought, was, I'm so smart. I'm the smartest person in the room. Why don't they want to give me money? Well, they want to give you money in your 20s because you had some early success, but you've taken some hits. And so, you know, you're a package of successes and failures. And so people, you know, who have been burned are going to be hesitant to throw money at you. Yeah. So you, but, and then, and you, you kind of, as his mentor at the time, were able to, just, were able to point out that gap that he had for himself. And so I guess, how do we, without a mentor or without guidance from somebody else, figure out what, if, like, if he didn't have you, how would have he been able to figure out where the gap is? Do you find where you're like struggling in life and like kind of just like self talk, ask yourself where, where I might have a gap. Okay, so here's the tip. You know, I'm just filled with all these little tips. All, the, you know, all these lost leaders. Um, <laughs> I mean, the wake up call is if you're going to a lot of things and you're not getting much results. You know, people aren't following up. People are saying this is great, and then they avoid you like the plague. Um, and, or you thought something was a, a sure thing, and it turned into be nothing. So a good discipline for you to do, and this is especially good in personal relationships, but we're talking about business things. After you've had conversations that you wanted to have a good result, ask yourself on a scale of 10, if I was the other person, how, uh, answer is the other person, how much they felt heard out by you, understood by you, and how much you added to the conversation. Mm. Heard out by you, understood by you, and added to the conversation. You know, as I mentioned, I have breakfast with Larry King every morning. And, and I'm a student of behavior communication. And something... Uh, that Larry's a master of, and you might want to write these things down. And uh, uh, so here, here's the, here's another three tips. Be a plusser. Don't be a minor, sir. Don't be a topper. What's a plusser? That means that you add to what the other person is saying in a meaningful way. And you add to the conversation by saying, by picking up emotional words or hyperbole like amazing, uh, incredible, horrendous. And after they stop talking, say, say more about the incredible. Say more about the horrendous. So that's, that's being a plusser. You're getting them to go deeper. Mm. Being, uh, being a minuser is when you start being negative. Oh, that'll never work. Uh, no one's going to invest in that. Or, you know, uh, why would you think that would work? You know, which is what a lot of people heard from their parents, which is why, you know, people who grew up in the East Coast ran away to the West Coast because they got away from their parents and people who grew up in the West Coast ran away to the East Coast. Yeah. Now, that'll never work. What's your day job? Why don't you get a salary? So I can be depressed like you, Dad? <laughs> anyway, that's a whole other story. <laughs> But but that's uh, uh, so a minor sir is someone who just who just sucks the energy out of your enthusiasm, uh, right. and then and then the final thing is the topper. You know, you think you're saying something, and they say something to top you. So you want to try to be a pluser uh, in your conversations. And so and so and so a pluser isn't necessarily that you're 
that you're adding a whole lot yourself, but you're you're adding to what you're you bringing. A, yeah, but or by by bringing more out of them that they want yes. to bring more. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So you're so used to this world that you're in. Plus, or you're used to oh, I can do such and such, and we can do such and such, and I and I can introduce you to such and such, and I have all these contacts. Oh, I'm connected to everybody on LinkedIn. Give me a freaking break. <laughs> so, uh, but but I think if you can discipline yourself, you know, try this in your ne- if you're listening in, try this in your next five conversations in the next week that you want to have a positive result, and ask yourself. How well did they feel heard out without my interrupting, without my getting competitive with them? Uh, Did they feel understood? And how much did they felt that I added to what they said? I I was a pluser. Yeah, I think that's a a really great conversation or yeah, really great few questions to be able to think about after leaving a conversation and to kind of stem off of that. You, you've used the phrase now, like you want to make sure the other person feels felt. And so from here, I kind of want to go into mirror neurons and mirror neuron receptor deficit. And first off, I know it because I've been listening to, I've been listening to the book, but t- t- briefly talk about what mirror neurons are and how we can use those, use that knowledge to our advantage when we're talking to and we're communicating to others in order to be able to make them feel felt. Okay, so mirror neurons were discovered in macaque monkeys, I think in the late 1980s, and they were parts of the monkey's brain that they were called, they were first called monkey see, monkey do neurons, because, uh, you know, if they would imitate each other. One monkey would stick its tongue out, the other monkey would stick its tongue out. In fact, if you stick your tongue out a monkey, they'll imitate you. So, uh, so... And they've discovered that they exist in human beings. And so they're thought that mirroring is what's connected to imitation, learning, and empathy. And when they're not functioning, they think, and I think there's clear evidence now, that it contributes to uh, Asperger's or autism, meaning you you can't tune in. You don't pick up social cues. And so in my studies as a, psychiatrist and especially a, uh, you know, I was a specialist in suicide prevention for 25 years. Um, I believe that if we're trying to mirror the outside world, you know, you know, because we want to, you know, we want to please them. We, we want to get the sale. We want to do whatever. We're keeping unconsciously, we're keeping score about, well, who's mirroring us? I mean, we're caring about other people. We're conforming to other people. But who cares about us? Yeah. And uh, it's not really scorekeeping. But what happens is if you feel that you've twisted yourself inside out to go along, you know, with the needs of another person, you know, there's a hunger for them to kind of care about you. And there are certain things that widen the mirror neuron gap, I now call it, because the other thing was you know, in the, in the paperback edition, it's called Mirror Neuron Gap. So sarcasm, uh, uh, criticism, being dismissive, uh, interrupting people, being a minuser or a topper, those all increase the mirror neuron gap. And the mirror neuron gap starts to trigger high cortisol. High cortisol is the stress hormone because you're getting ticked off. You're getting frustrated. Uh, with high cortisol then drifts over to our mind and starts to fiddle with something in our brain called the amygdala. So under stress, high cortisol triggers our amygdala and something can happen that some of your listeners will know about called an amygdala hijack, which means if we're really pissed off, instead of thinking clearly, we'll either go into a fight flight or freeze mentality and we can't think so um and there's a lot of this going on in fact one of the reasons uh what's going on with school shooters is the mirror neuron gap they feel the world is basically i once heard a phrase uh people who feel put down and pushed away put down and pushed away 
find a way to get in, get in and get even. Mm. So you can feel the mirror neuron gap. The world is bullying them, laughing at them, humiliating them. And so the gap is so huge that they can't think anymore. The cortisol goes up. Their amygdala triggers fight or flight retaliation. And then there's either violence or suicide. Now, the, there are ways to, uh, to eliminate the mirror neuron gap. And the best way, and part of why I think Just Listen has done so well, it's about how do you cause people to feel felt? That's different than feeling understood. Right. And so a mirror neuron gap, say I'm somebody who has a mirror neuron gap. I'm somebody who has the high cortisol level and I'm feeling not felt by others, correct? Yeah. And so you're feeling agitated. You're feeling impatient. You're feeling like either you want to shut down or you want to uh, uh, retaliate. And right. you're not listening. There's not a conversation going. Uh, so I'm going to give you the best tip. This is the, this is the you know, so I hope people listen all the way through because what I'm going to give you is magical. So you ready? Get your pencil and paper. I think this is in talking to crazy, you know, which is how to, you know, just listen is how do you open people up. Talking to crazy is how do you disarm people, you know, literally and, you know, the people that drive you crazy. And what I talk about is something called the FUD crud. And crud is just, you know, I was being infantile and it just, I wrote it. But what FUD stands for is frustrated, upset, disappointed. And it's magical. So let's say someone's venting at you. Okay. So a lot of times if someone vents at you, what happens is you kind of arch your back. You say, now calm down, which of course makes them more upset. Or you're talking crazy, uh, which makes them feel more upset. Or you're too emotional. So that's not that helpful. Get a hold of yourself. Uh, and I can understand that that's human nature. But, uh, but that actually increases their frustration. And you're doing it because you want to get control because they're invading your space. The way the FUD crud works is so next time someone is venting at you or whining or complaining, let them finish, look them directly in the eye, you know, be, as opposed to trying to look away because you, know, you want to kill them or run away from them. Uh, let them finish, look them directly in the eye, wait a second, which shows them that you're not reacting, and you say to them, you sound frustrated and I think you're holding back. They're going to go, what? Yeah. You sound frustrated and I think you're holding back because I think you're upset and disappointed too. Why don't you fill me in on all of those? And you want to start with frustrated because people will talk about being frustrated, but if you say, you sound angry, it sounds like you're scolding them. But if you say, you, you sound frustrated and I think you're holding back because I think you're upset and disappointed. Tell me about all of those. And I am wow. telling you, it is magical. But That's can you crazy, see, yep. that, can you see how that flips the mirror neuron gap? It goes from frustration, sure. frustration to, Oh my God. And what happens is you want them to talk at all the, all their frustration upset out. So when they yeah. hear, you hear emotional words, you say, say more about angry, say more about upset, say more about I did such and such and I was such an idiot. So you want to pull all that out. And then, be, but, but really where you want to get them to is talking about disappointment because that's much calmer. So you're more disappointed in me. Are you disappointed in the situation? Are you disappointed in you? What's that about? You know, I, I, you know, I've trained hostage negotiators. So, you know, when they use some of this stuff, you know, it works. Oh, yeah. No, and I really I really like how it, you, like you said, it starts with frustrated because that is something that's much easier to talk about and somebody's okay with talking about being frustrated. But if you're like, you sound upset, you're like, I'm not upset. I'm just frustrated is probably what a lot of people would come back with. Um, so that's a great way to basically try to close somebody else's mirror neuron gap. Say that somebody is listening and be like, and say like, I feel, and someone is saying, I feel frustrated, I feel upset, I feel disappointed. 
what something that I can do to like try to minimize my own mirror neuron gap? Like how do I get around the people that can help me do that for myself? Well, you can ask, I'll tell you what I do. Um, For some reason or other, I've never, it's never worked in me to say these positive affirmations. You know, I'm kind of jealous when the people can say positive things about themselves, but I got to tell you, they've never worked on me. Yeah. You're a good person and you deserve to be successful. Give me an effing break. (laughs) But what I do have, as I mentioned, you know, I, I, I have all these, I mentor lots of people to stay relevant. And the reason for that is I've had seven mentors and they've all died. And so what I do is I use, I have conversations with what I call the dead mentor society. So when I'm really upset, I'll, I'll reach up to one of my dead mentors. And I think that, you know, I'm going by, you know, your, my guess is even though we're all over the place, there's enough nuggets that you'll say, Mark, you did fine. You know, but 10 years ago, I would have reached up to one of my dead mentors and said, oh, I did it again. Am I ever going to learn to just go stay on track? I mean, I was all over the place in this interview. Um, and, you know, you know, I'm sure I frustrated people who just want a linear kind of thing. Well, those people checked out 20 minutes ago from this particular interview. Um, and, and now what happens is when I talk to one of my dead mentors, First of all, they'll say, what are you waking me up for, Mark? I said, yeah, I, I need your help to talk me down from DEFCON 1 to DEFCON 4 because I blew it again. And what they'll say is, uh, uh, well, what would the host think? Well, they want me back. You know, Mark, Mark, you didn't blow it. You know, you're, you're just spontaneous. It's okay, Mark. And so, you know, at my age, I've learned to sort of let it go. But what I do and what you can do if you're a listener, if you're like me and you can't use these affirmations, imagine someone living or dead who cares about you or cared about you. And imagine them, just picture them. Picture them believing in you. Uh, like, do you have, Can you think of some people like that, Nick? Yeah. Can you think of one? Pick one. You get something like that. So just imagine them talking you through it. Picture the uh, picture you talking to them in your mind. You're saying, oh, I'm so upset. You know, I just feel like I, I don't care. I just feel like getting even. I, you know, I just can't stand this such and such. And, you know, I just, you know, um, and just picture them talking you down. And you might even picture them using the FUD on you. Yeah. Nick, you sound frustrated. What frustrated you? Well, this happened with this person. I thought we were going to have a good partnership, and it turns out they just lied again. And yada, yada, yada. And what are you upset about? Well, I thought I could trust them. They say, I thought they had changed, but they didn't change. But what are you disappointed in? Well, now i got to go find another partner. Now i got to do it all over again. You know, uh, I don't want to be cynical, but sometimes it feels like nobody ever changes. And I got to go through the whole process again because I need people to help me in this part of my business because I can't do it by myself. But can you picture that? So for me, calling upon those people helps talk me down. And again, I can pick people who are living. And by the way, if I pick people, I make sure that I, uh, I thank them. I mean, at the end of the day, I could say, I didn't call you, but I used you today to talk me down from something. Yeah. And if, I don't, I, if I don't let you know how important you are, um, I'm sorry. And sometimes I've done that with some dead mentors, and then I reach out to their next of kin. I say, you know, this is a long overdue telephone call. Your dad, your mom, your husband, they changed my life. And, awesome. uh, and I'll tell you, it makes you feel better. When yeah, you do that. I'm sure. So there's been a few times now 
and there's a lot of a lot of your tips and techniques in your in your book are like this way. So there's been a couple times now where you've talked about to close your own mirror neuron gap. You can talk to or you can have that conversation with somebody who believes in you, and you can have it not necessarily with them. You can have it in your own head. And you also talked about how if you leave a conversation, ask yourself what the other person had, what the other person's perception was of you during the conversation. So why do we have a clear perspective when we put ourselves in somebody else's shoes? You know what I mean? Like even if we're not even with them, but we're playing it out in our head, why do we have a clear perspective just with simply doing that small technique? Well, I think part of it is because we, uh, we're getting out of the pedal to the metal, uh, adrenaline, dopamine driven mindset that we live in too much. Okay. I want to share, can I share a touching story that I, you know, hopefully your listeners will like, uh, mm-hmm. so, I'm a, so I'm a suicide specialist and uh, I'm part of a couple documentaries. Uh, one of them is where I interviewed Kevin Hines. He jumped off the Golden Gate Bridge and lived. And, and, and we have a documentary called uh, Stay Alive, uh, an intimate conversation about suicide prevention. And about six months ago, I went to Hollywood High School for an after-school thing. And these were high school students. And it was a mental health day dealing with stress. And it was in the cafeteria. And there was a panel. And there was a life coach and a therapist. And whenever I'm on a panel, I say, I want to go last because I'm very quick on my feet. I don't have, I don't have a prepared pat answer for anything, but I can sometimes narrow the mirror neuron gap. So what I noticed is these were really great panelists, but I could see that the students were getting agitated. You know, they were starting to look at their text messages. It was a little bit too theoretical. So what I said to the, uh, so picture this 40 students in the cafeteria. uh, And I said, I'm going to try something different, something that I actually have used with depressed and suicidal people. I'm going to mention eight words. I I want each of you to think of a real bad time in the last week. You know, I'm not going to ask you to talk about it, but think of a bad time in the last week. And I'm going to mention eight words, and then you're each going to tell me, what, you're each going to pick a word that goes along with how you felt. And then I changed my voice into NPR voice instead of AM, yada, 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 millennial voice. And so I said, so here are the words. Anxious. Depressed. Afraid. Angry ashamed, alone, lonely, tired, pick one. And so, so picture this, I'm looking out at these 40 students and one by one, they picked the word alone, shamed, angry. And then I asked them afterwards, I said, how did that feel? They said, that felt great. I said, what do you mean? They said, I didn't feel so alone. Did you judge any of the other kids? No, no, not at all. I I felt close to them. And I said, here's your challenge. There are four emotions that you live with, and this goes along to some of your audience, Nick. And that is excitement, boredom, fear, and anger. Excitement, boredom, fear, and anger. And what just happened is you got a taste of closeness. You don't do closeness. Mm. And you say it felt better. So write down the eight words. And when you're, you have a friend who's in a dark place, you can say, and, and they may not want to talk about it. I don't want to talk. I'm fine. And, and here's an, a neat insight that I got from a friend of mine that I'm part of a suicide documentary with him because his son killed himself two years ago. This was so brilliant that it hurt. He said, you know, when you, say to, when you ask someone, how are you doing? And they say, I'm great, they're usually good. But when they say, I'm fine, they're not. Mm. Boy, did that hit me when he told me that. Yeah. So if, so if you have a friend who says, I'm fine, 
you can say, you know, I, you know, I heard these eight words, you know, on this, you know, this podcast with this crazy psychiatrist who was all over the place, who talks to dead mentors. Um, <laughs> uh, and here are the eight words. And, you know, pick one. Hmm. And it's different when you do it that way as opposed to saying it as a question. See, when you list the words and they try them on, that's different than asking a question. If you ask someone, it's an interrogation. Yeah. Well, are, yeah. you feeling, are you feeling anxious? No, no, no. Instead, you lay, out the, you lay out the eight words because everybody who is stressed out feels one or more of those words. So who's the right person to be able to do that to, to where it's not like invasive? Like you, do you have to know the person pretty well or can you do it with kind of most people that you have some whatever relationship with? Like what, where do you draw the line between it's like kind of okay to do versus it's being a little bit too invasive? Well, I think you have to practice it. Uh, but I'll tell you, if your caring is genuine, if you see someone is hurting and you get a sense they're really alone in it, you can do it with a stranger, but you, I wouldn't do it right out of the gate. Right. But, you know, I'd have a conversation and you could say, you know, you know I, I heard this thing called eight words. And as I'm with you, and see, when you give people the, an actual word to express how they're feeling, they feel felt the mirror neuron gap lessens, oxytocin, which is the bonding hormone, goes up, cortisol goes down, amygdala hijack settles down. They may cry, but they're crying with relief. They're not crying because you made them cry. They're crying because you let them cry. Yeah, I like that. I like that. Um, geez, <laughs> I've been loving this. This is so good. Um, all right. I want to, let's see, I want to go to, so th this is a topic that I've been started to be very curious about because I'm interviewing a lot of people in leadership. I'm listening to a lot of things on leadership and it's very popular today to talk about as a leader, you need to make sure that you're open and, and vulnerable and be willing to kind of express your weaknesses. However, there are also certain times that you read about in books, hear about in stories and experiences where like the leader did a really good job of like not showing their lack of weakness or not showing their lack of belief in themselves. And so what I've started to really think about is where, what's, where's the line drawn between like when you should be okay with being vulnerable, showing your weakness, that sort of thing versus when you need to like stay strong and not necessarily show those things. And I'll leave it at that. Well, if you're listening in, here's a shameless thing. Check out my podcast called My Wake Up Call. And I speak to influencers and they're very personal. In fact, I, in fact half of the people have said it's the most personal conversation they've ever had in public. And I've said, we don't have to post it. And all of them have said, no, I want people to see this part of me. You just made it safe to come out. It just doesn't come out. And I think what, what's inspiring is seeing determination. So you can share your weakness and you can be vulnerable, but when people feel your determination that you weren't going to give into it, Mm. Uh, people are drawn to that. People are inspired by that. So uh, uh, here's another formula. We have a little more yeah. time. You know. Yeah, yeah. Can I? I want to. I want to mention one thing on that, just because as I was writing this thought, the I've been th I've thought about this a lot over the last like number of months, and as I was like writing down on my notes that I wanted to bring that up today. I almost like thought in my head of a, p a p potential distinction and, and you kind of brought it to light a little bit as well. It's almost like if you can be 
you always want to show and demonstrate your own belief in yourself and you use the word determination. So it's like, it's always okay to be vulnerable or show weakness as long as you still believe in yourself. Um, I don't know. I feel, I feel like the belief in the determination thing was, was key. Yeah. So I think the determination is determination is a commitment to staying in the game and seeing it through. You may not know how it's going to turn up. Um, uh, like, you know, when I would meet with suicidal patients and I think, you know, none of them, for 25 years, none of them killed themselves. And, but what would happen is I would go into the dark night of the soul. I'd keep them company there. And, um, and they would look at me and they'd say, am I going to get through this? And I would say, yes. And they'd say, well, how do you know it? Well, because it's happened several hundred times. Do you have any idea how we're going to get through this? I say, no, but we will. Mm -hmm. Because there's... Uh, because there's going to be a place in your, and, and what I would tell them, I'd say, I'm not here to stop you from killing yourself. I'm here to get you to a place where you're glad to be alive and you can think I'm out of my fricking mind to think that I'll get you there, but I'm not letting go. Do you understand? Yeah. I'm not letting go. And I don't know how we're going to get there, but I'm not letting go. And can you, can you feel the determination? And they, they just start crying. Oh my God. Because that's exactly what they wanted. Everyone didn't want them to kill themselves. And I said, no, that would be a mean trick to, to stop you from killing yourself and hate your life. That'd be cruel. We're going to get you to a place where you're glad to be alive. And I don't know how we're going to get there, but we're going to do it together. Wow. And you don't have to believe it. Do you, can you feel the relief that that gives them? Yeah, no doubt. No doubt. Here's another little tip. Here's a great story you got. People are going to like okay. about leadership. So write this down: aggression plus principle equals conviction. Aggression plus principle equals conviction. Aggression minus principle equals hostility. So it's good to have aggression to be an aggressive athlete, but it's got to be tied either to principle or a mission, uh, whereas if it's just, if it's tied to nothing, uh, you just become hostile. Mm. So conviction makes you strong, hostility makes you wild. And the best demonstration of it, and I think it'll translate, let me see, uh, I'm gonna predict that the hairs in the back of your neck are gonna stand up. So pat them down, pat them down, because I like a good challenge. So years ago, I was at a convention and Colin Powell, General Colin Powell, who was being considered for president, uh, was speaking. And it was a real estate convention, 10,000 people in the Dallas Auditorium. And, you know, a lot of real estate people are transactional. You know, you know it feels almost like an inspirational speaker is, is wasted on people who are just looking for business. And I remember he said something like um, how grateful he was to his community and how proud he was to give back. He was the real deal. And then during the question and answer, this is 11.30 in the morning, some guy says, General Powell, I understand that your wife uh, was in a psychiatric hospital, that she was depressed. I think she had shock treatment. Do you want to comment on that, sir? And the whole Dallas auditorium went just quiet. I was thinking, what's he going to say? Is he going to ignore the person? Is he going to, he's not going to, you don't remember this, but there was a presidential candidate named Edmund Muskie who started crying when someone said something about his wife, killed this whole campaign. I said, he's not going to cry. He's a general. Is he going to say something politically correct? Uh, because it was true. You know, his wife had been depressed. But this is what he said. So imagine you're in the audience and you're thinking, what's he going to say? And here's the aggression plus principle. He said, excuse me, sir. 
the person you love more than anyone in this world is living in hell, and you don't do everything you can to get them out, do you have a problem with that, sir? Mm. You feel the power of that? Yeah. Whew. I mean, I'm feeling it now, like, wow. You know, yeah. we're, we're the leaders like this. That's who we need, but, uh, but that's aggression plus principle. Yeah. Meaning, you know, yeah, say whatever you want about me, but don't you talk about my wife. Mm. Yeah, well, I've loved where, where all these different tips and everything where the interviews have where the interview has gone very different, but super unique and, and super valuable nonetheless. And I can't wait to chomp it up into short bits um, as well to, to throw out there. But I do want to get to uh, the last couple of things. And these are questions that I like to ask everybody. And so the second to last question is, is there a skill or, and so I'll, I'll preface it real quick, because I think one of the be- the most important things in order to get closer to the best version of yourself is to kind of try to mentally paint a picture of what the best version of yourself looks like and kind of what that best version of yourself is capable of. And like my goal every single day is to get a more clear distinction on what that person is and then to try to reverse engineer them to make that person a reality. And so what I want to ask you for the second to last question, is there a specific skill or specific piece of knowledge that the best version of yourself has that you don't currently have? So if you're listening, uh, look up uh, uh, Goulston, G-O-U-L-S-T-O-N, of goodness and mercy. Goulston of goodness and mercy. It's a sermon I gave at a church, and I'm Jewish. (laughs) And what I talked about is dealing with your shadow. And... uh, Carl Jung was a famous psychologist, and your shadow is the part of your personality that you want to avoid admitting to yourself, because if you admit it to yourself, you feel ashamed, and everybody has a shadow. Uh, And it takes enormous mental energy to keep that out of awareness, and you will certainly keep it away from other people, because if down deep it makes you feel more ashamed of yourself, You think other people are going to judge you. And when I realize that everybody has a shadow, but as long as you don't act on it, you're okay, it can free you to be your best self. Mm. So I really, now people don't pick this up in me, and you might say, you know, Mark, I haven't picked up any of that. Uh, And I'm not even aware of it. Part of my shadow is I can be judgmental, I can hold grudges, I can be a a scorekeeper, Uh, I can root for bad things to happen to my friends if they're more successful than me. I'm not aware of any of this, but I know it's in there. But when I realize that everybody has a shadow, and as long as you don't act on it, you're good to go, I am telling you, it has been so freeing And what I will tell your listeners and you, unless you deal with that shadow, and the way to deal with it is to just accept that you have it. As long as you don't act on it, you're a good person, and everybody has a shadow. And so I don't think you can be the best person, the best version of yourself, if down deep you have these shadowy elements that you're using a lot of psychological energy to keep out of your awareness and other people's awareness. Gotcha. So, well, because you brought that up, is there a particular shadow that you have right now that you are maybe not acting on all the time, but you find yourself sometimes acting on that you are currently working on of like not acting on? Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, you know, and, and you'll give me a pass, but if you notice behind me, there's a traffic light. Right. In the middle of that, that's a yellow. It must be a bad reflection. And one of the reasons I keep that traffic light is because I wrote the top book on listening in the world, and I can be a shitty listener. Mm. And I get away with it because I can say such pithy things and insightful things. 
But what now I can get away with it because I'm the guest and you're picking my brain and so far it hasn't put you to sleep. So I can get away with it here. But when I'm in conversations with other people, in fact, if you look up Goulston, um, how to know if you talk too much. It's a Harvard Business Review uh, article or blog. It was like they're top rated for a couple of weeks. Wow. And, and in it, I talk about the traffic light rule. And the traffic light rule is that when you're at a networking event and when you're not a guest on a podcast where you're allowed to go on and on, basically, when you're talking and they haven't invited you to give a, a monologue, you have 20 seconds before the green light turns to yellow and you have another 20 seconds before the yellow turns to red and you've worn out your welcome in 40 seconds. Wow. And the point is you won't be aware of it because you won't pick up on the cues like the people looking over your shoulder, you know, they're looking at their watch, they want to get away from you. You're just feeling great because you're having this high colonic, oh, I'm getting so much off my chest, this feels so great. You know, I mean, you know, you go another minute and they're going to be going like this. <laughs> you know, uh, and so one of my shadows is I can feel the relief when I'm talking and someone like you is interested and listening and fascinated. And it's very seductive to me. Yeah. And it's not, it's not my best self. As I said, I can get away with it on these podcasts because – you know, I'm a guest and, you know, and I know I say some things that are kind of humorous and insightful, but I don't want to do this in person. Yeah. But I slip into it. I like that. I like that. Well, before I ask the last question, I want to acknowledge you for being able to be self-aware enough to pick out those shadows and be able to intentionally and deliberately, to use your word, try to act on that or try to act on not acting on them, I should say. Um, and then, yeah, I just think that, that your the thought that you've put into your work over the, the years and years and years has been so consistent and so deliberate. And then I also um, want to make sure I acknowledge you for trying to stay relevant, even though, you know, even though you're a little bit older. And I think a lot of people who are probably your age are okay with where they are, and not, not that that's a bad thing, but I would just think it's really cool to see somebody who is continually trying to stay relevant, see what's going on um, like with the younger people and find a way to connect with them with being concise and clear. Um, so I just think that's awesome, and I'm super honored to uh, have you on the show. So how was I relevant today, even though I was scattered? Yeah, I, you you one hundred percent you one hundred percent were you you hundred percent were you were good you were really great at uh, making sure before you talked about matters, kind of prefacing it to where it was like okay, now it's time to be put, to pay attention because I think a lot of people don't do that. They just kind of talk, 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 and it's it's less engaging that way. But when you find ways to kind of real people back in it's like okay this is what i'm listening for and they have a little bit more of a targeted focus when they're listening and i think that's really important so i don't have to call up a dead mentor after this one to talk me <laughs> off a cliff <laughs> <laughs> not not this one not this one um but i want to make sure everybody goes in and supports you as as uh, as much as possible so where can people go get the book uh and where can they find you on social media and all that kind of stuff so you continue so you can continue to be more and more relevant okay so something we didn't talk about maybe if if yes. you get more if you get more requests to have more of me we'll do another show uh i've launched a global movement called hashtag #wmyst which stands for what made you smile today and uh and I launched it informally in Moscow to a, to a thousand Russians and I got them to all stand up and go over to someone they didn't know and say, what made you smile? And people said, you can't do that with Russians. They did it. But I was waiting for the TEDx to come out and it just came out yesterday. Mm -hmm. So if you look up what made you smile today, TEDx on YouTube, and and you'll be impressed with how 
concise and clear I was. <laughs> I mean, I, I looked at him, I said, Gee, boy, boy, you really had your act together, Mark. I mean, wow, that's pretty good. You weren't all over the place. Well, because I knew it was, you know, they have a formula and you need to be relevant. 13 minutes clear. or whatever. Yeah, if you, and, and trust me, you want to do a TEDx talk? Be relevant, clear, concise, and be gone. Mm. So, um, so I hope you'll check it out. Uh, we have an Instagram thing called at WMYST Global. And, and how we're doing it basically is, uh, and you'll hear the story. It's an interesting story for my TEDx talk about how I, a good friend of mine kept texting his 22-year-old daughter who was a drug addict who he hated talking to, but he just kept texting her, what made you smile today? What made you smile today? Every day at five. And, 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 and finally, she just started opening up saying, well, dad, if you must know, getting a text from you. And he started to cry because he started liking her and then she was off drugs in two months. So you could, I don't want to tell the whole story. But what I've been doing since then is every day when I see one of the name tagged faceless people in the world who feel like appliances, the cashiers, the TSA agents, they have a name tag. And after they serve me, I go up to them and I said, like I said to Carmen at McDonald's, I said, Carmen, thank you. My name is Mark. Thank you for you know, helping me. I have a question for you. No, no, you're not in any trouble. You're not in any trouble. Don't worry. And then I pause and I say, what made you smile today, Carmen? And Carmen looked at me and sometimes they say, getting up today, uh, it's a beautiful day. And what Carmen said to me, she just stopped and she had this huge smile and she said, seeing you, sweetie. <laughs> and then what I do is, is we have these wristbands and I give two wristbands out to people every day and I say, you know, you got a great smile. Here's a reminder to use it every day and here's the second wristband. You know, give it to someone else like I just gave it to you. And so it's like the ice bucket challenge. So yeah. let's end. What made you smile today, Nick? What made me smile? I had a lot of smiles today. It's been a good day. Well, I'll, I'll start off with my, I, I guess it's not my first smile, but close to it. And uh, I just started doing a goal setting program with a fitness goal for eight individuals. And so everybody came and we did a group workout today at 5 a.m. And just honestly, it's asking a lot of people to get up that early and, and work out and put their body through one of one of my workouts. So it honestly just makes me smile seeing them show up with their willingness to put them through it. And, and, and can you feel that just telling me you just relived it? <laughs> oh, yeah. 100%. I've, I think when I was saying it, I pictured their faces walking in. And see what's happened is I'm feeling your gratitude towards me for giving you a second hit of it. And, and one of the nice things about just asking this of people is we get out of our self-absorption. You know, when you can make even the small people feel significant, it's amazing. I did that with someone, uh, a young man in India. I, I, I mean, you know, people write me and, and I'm a little disorganized, which you can pick up. And, and you know, I'll respond to a homeless person in India as quickly as I respond to a, a, Fortune, 5, a Fortune 50 CEO. You know, I'm a little bit, I, I got to get my act together there. And so this was a, a rule. And, you know, and I guess I gave him some advice. And I said, a rule, what made you smile today? And he said, no one as important as you has ever typed my name. So every day I go back to my computer and I touch what you typed with my finger and I touch my name. Wow. Do you know what that does for me? Forget. That changed his life. Do you know what that does for me? Wow. Oh, yeah. So, so I hope if you're listening in, you'll join the movement. You can go to actually WMYST.org. Uh, you know, we're not selling stuff. Uh, we'll probably make it available if you want to get the wristbands. We haven't figured. Yeah, out. I, I want to get. I want to get some of those wristbands because I want to challenge myself. Because I teach a lot of fitness classes too, and I want to challenge myself to ask just one person a day that comes to one of my fitness classes the questions 
Well, awesome. Well, good deal. Well, uh, the last question is, uh, I believe the that becoming the best version of yourself is a constant journey, and I believe it's a unique journey. I think the w- way that I'm going to get to the best version of myself is going to be a little bit different than the way that you get to the best version of yourself. So what I want to ask for you personally, if there are, is what are three things that you could currently do or currently work on to get closer to that best version of yourself? So something I learned from a friend of mine who was the CEO of Mattel, and he used this to get through any tough times and help them sleep at night. So uh, what he would do the night before he went to sleep is he would say to himself, what can I get done tomorrow to make Mattel a better company? Not what can I do, not a to-do list, but if you go to sleep and you say, what can I get done tomorrow to be a better version of myself? The second tip is, uh, who, who can I listen to tomorrow and be present so that the world sees that I care about it as much as getting ahead in life. Wow. And then the third thing is, um, who do I need to forgive today? I like it. I like it. That's actually the the first one is something that I try to practice nightly is kind of like what does essentially what does success look like tomorrow or what can I do to ensure that I'm a little bit further along tomorrow than I was today. But uh, yeah, but I think getting getting done puts a bookend on it. So that's that's why I'd help the Mattel person because it's different to say what can I do tomorrow yeah. is is, is kind of open ended. But if you can say what can I get done tomorrow? Yes. To make Mattel a better cut. So so and and again, you don't have to commit to it. Obviously you'll you'll be a better version of yourself if you commit to it, but it can it can give you a way to put your mind at rest because you know, when you go to sleep, oh, this is what I'm gonna get done tomorrow. Yeah, no, I've 100% experienced that myself, no doubt. Well, (laughs) Dr. Golson, that was awesome. Um, Definitely, definitely exceeded my expectations, so I greatly appreciate it. Well, thank you for having me on.